<clears throat> okay. Just letting a few other people show up before we before we begin. Thanks for everybody who is online with us now. Hopefully the audio is okay. All right. All right. Sounds like the audio is good. All right, we're gonna get started in just one minute. I just wanna give people a chance to, to join. I've gotten a couple of emails from people asking for the link. Um, to be honest, I don't know about that because I've only initiated these. I've never actually joined one. So um, we'll be looking into it. Also, just for everybody's, um, Information, we're going to be letting uh, letting anybody download this recording later on. It takes a couple of hours to upload, depending on how, how long we go. Um, once that recording is live, everybody will have access to it. Yeah, so if, apparently the, uh, I think anybody here already knows where the, how to join. The event. I'm not too worried about that, but um, a couple of folks asking. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna begin now. So very quickly, gonna introduce myself. My name is Ben Watson. For those of for those of you that don't know me, 
um, started this company close to three years ago, um, not on my own by any means. Um, we have a really great team that we've, we've put together. Um, and we have, I've spent probably close to 10 years working in biomechanics, um, primarily working in the research world. And the feedback sort of that I, I kept getting over and over again from, from customers, from people running labs, et cetera, was that the technology in biomechanics was just overly complicated, right? So what we set out to do when we started this company is we wanted to build a product that was designed for coaches sort of on the, on the ground and take a slightly different approach in terms of the way that we built the system and the way we think about users and the way that we provide information to users and really tried to emphasize sometimes to a fault um, that this is really meant to be used by anybody. Our system is not designed to be another lab uh, lab system that gets used three times a year or just for somebody's PhD and then it's, it's, it's shut away. We really um, don't often see that with our system. We don't like to see that either. Uh, one of the things that we continually um, have seen as well in, in the biomechanics world is just the the pure cost of, of a lot of solutions out there. They're just expensive. Um, so another thing we really tried to do when starting this company is, um, sorry, somebody's chatting, <laughs> lower the cost, right? So bring the price down for, for force plates. Uh, force plates are extremely powerful, extremely useful, um, extremely simple, but they're also extremely expensive. And so we really are working on um, continually bringing the price down as much as we can to open up this type of technology to as many people as possible. Because I think uh, when you understand some of the core fundamental concepts, the information that you can get from a force plate is extremely useful and applies to a ton of populations, not specifically uh, just sporting populations. So with that, I'll introduce Jason Lake. He is with us today. I have muted him, which I may have to do from time to time. Oh, it looks like he's unmuted himself, but uh, <laughs> Jason can introduce himself. Hi, I'm Jason Lake. I'm a researcher. I'm a reader in sport and exercise biomechanics at the University of Chichester in the UK, and I am a proper force plate nerd. Nice. That sounds about right. Um, <laughs> so what we want to talk about today on this webinar is really just some, some really simple best practices. Um, we're not going to get super, super in depth. Maybe we will on a couple of points, but the goal is really to provide more information to folks who, who just haven't found it anywhere, right? So what we've noticed, there aren't a lot of resources that are just out there um, beyond, obviously, you know, there's a lot of good research papers. There's a lot of not so good research papers, but um, what we're trying to do is, is provide a, a resource for coaches who are interested in learning more about force plates, best practices, how to do things, how things are done, et cetera, um, but not feel like it's, it's over their head or overly complicated for the sake of being complicated. Not to say anything negative about Jason, but, you know, we don't all have PhDs in biomechanics. So um, our goal is to put things into common sort of standard language, just make it more accessible. Um, that's, that's a big mission of our company. We really want to provide resources to as many people as we can um, to really increase the um gosh people keep chatting this is totally distracting oh it's adam okay cool um so just a, a quick note um we're not going to talk about any other companies uh in, in a negative way um that's not something we do it's something we really 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 discourage so if people have questions about how their system works like we're happy to chat about it offline um but we're we're not going to um, question anybody's methods or, or and we're also not going to judge anybody for what system they're using that's definitely not our, our thing um, we just want to talk to people who use force plates or who might be interested in using force plates it doesn't have to be our product um, you know that's that's just something I wanted to say because um, this isn't just purely a platform for us to promote ourselves you know or, or to get people to buy our force plates obviously you know we like we like when people use our products but um, our goal is really to spread more information uh, to more coaches who who we think really need it. And, and the feedback we get all the time is that, you know, there aren't enough resources for just for simple information. So that's enough of that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and jump into this, no pun intended. So first of all, we're going to focus primarily today on the counter movement jump. It's obviously the most commonly used test um, by a mile um, for a lot of reasons. It's It's very well studied. There's tons and tons of papers. Um, you can reach out to Jason or myself afterwards. We can send you a list of, of publications that might be good. Jason's probably on like half of them. 
Um, yeah. oh. but, <laughs> but uh, the counter movement jump is, is a really just a fundamental test. It's a very, very, like I said, well studied. So we understand a lot about it. And what I'm going to talk about today is kind of some of the things that we can take out of this, the, the counter movement jump, but I really want to emphasize how to perform the counter movement jump as a test, as a standardized test, rather than purely um, get into like the details of metrics, et cetera. Jason's been working on some blogs as well for on our on our blog that are, I think, really useful um, on sort of what should I look at, what's important, et cetera. Um, today we want to focus on, I think, one of the biggest issues that we found is, you know, how do I do the test correctly? Uh, what what is a bad counter movement jump, quote unquote? Um, why are we doing things a certain way, or why aren't we doing them another way? Um, we want to we want to be really transparent with everybody how we calculate things and how we perform things. Um, we're, we have nothing to hide. There's nothing proprietary. Well, it's not true. There's a lot of proprietary stuff, but there's nothing uh, magic or, um, you know, anything that's proprietary to us is, is literally a code. It's not um, math, you know, math's math. Um, so I'm going to just animate this so you can understand. This is basically counter movement jump. And you can see it's highlighted. We have three phases here. We have an unweighting phase, a breaking phase, and a propulsive phase. Those are the terms that we use. Um, there's some papers that talk about um, Different different phases of the counter movement jump, and I'm happy to again share anybody who's interested share some some links to some papers that I think do a nice job. Um, there's a little bit of disagreement in the research world in terms of how we name different phases. Uh, I can really very simply highlight why we we do things the way that we do. So this is the force trace. What I'm going to do on the next slide is the exact same trace we're going to look at, but it's going to be the velocity trace. And so this is the same jump, and this is what the velocity trace looks like. So we, de we determine the phases based off of the magnitude and dire direction and magnitude uh, of the velocity of the center of mass of the, of the jumper. So the unweighting phase, we define it as when the velocity is negative and it is descending. As soon as the velocity starts to ascend, we call that the braking phase. It's literally when the athlete is applying the brakes. So a lot of people will call that the eccentric phase. That's fine. I'm not really, um, yeah, I don't really have an opinion on that's That's up to you. Um, you know, we'll, we'll often use that as a, a, a stand in just to, to clarify things, but it's literally when the athlete is applying the brakes, the low, as they, as they descend, they reach the lowest point velocity hits zero. And then the propulsive phase begins, which is what we see here with the green takeoff is at, at this point when there's obviously uh, no more phase. And then we have falling velocity continues to fall. You land, you absorb the force, stabilize the body and velocity should return to zero. We can talk something uh, a little bit about velocity returning to zero as well. Um, but thinking on on the velocity trace, it sorry, I'm not like super skilled at PowerPoint. Um, and I did this last night. So if anybody has any issues with the PowerPoint, sorry. <laughs> um, the phases of the, of the counter movement jump are essential. We can, we basically use the phases, we can then give you average peak force, we can do power during any of the different phases. Um, it's really, really important that we identify these phases because there's there's a change occurring. There's something in interesting and there's something useful to take away from each phase. The propulsive phase and, and this green shaded area being our propulsive impulse um, is going to determine how high you jump, period. Um, so knowing that we use velocity to calculate when these phases are occurring or to determine when they occur, um, it, it's pretty important that you get an accurate velocity integration, you actually begin the velocity integration at the right time. And so that's kind of brings us to the topic that we really wanted to focus on today, which is the quiet phase before a jump begins. It's not the most exciting thing, I'm not going to lie, but hopefully we can um, illustrate for you why it's valuable and why it's important. So you would think, okay, well, we're going to calculate velocity. There's got to be one way to calculate velocity, but the truth is, and Jason's going to take over here in the next slide, is there are there is not one way to, to do this. Um, yeah, I'll let Jason continue. Look at this absolute monstrosity. It's abysmal, look at it. However, <laughs> this is all the information you'll get from the web, or, or sorry, not from the web at all, from the research literature on the different uh, start thresholds that people have used to identify the counter movement start. And oh my God, it ranges from anything from an absolute, uh, an absolute value of say body weight plus five Newtons or body weight less five Newtons all the way to that five standard deviations method. And the problem is there is such a mix that unless we achieve some sort of general consensus in the, in the uh, research and practitioner field, 
we're kind of on a hide into nothing because it essentially means there's no consistency. And so we're going to have a real hard time comparing data from system to system or from research group to research group or from practitioner to practitioner. And so I guess what we're trying to do and what Ben's already explained, I guess, is to make this kind of stuff far more accessible to try and, you know, remove that um, shroud of blooming mystery that we seem to surround it with. It's really simple. Force plates are probably the simplest bit of biomechanics kit around. And last week, I, you know, I explained it was essentially a really expensive, really fancy bar from scale. And that's essentially what they are. They record data. All you have to do is if you set the thing up properly, is you press the button and collect that data. But there are a couple of things that you have to ensure you do. And it's absolute, Ben calls it, you know, important. I would say it's absolutely critical because without it, you're not going to be able to identify the phases that you might be interested in. Or you might not necessarily be interested in them now, but phases that you could go back to and start to get an answer or start to get a, a bit of a story about why an athlete performs in a particular way at a particular point in time. So I think rather than just thinking about um, this kind of thing, i.e. getting a, a nice, sound, robust, quiet standing period as an immediate thing, think of it as something that's essentially an investment in your practice and your athlete's um, information because the quality of the standards that you put into your protocols now will enable you to revisit these data over and over again. I can't emphasize that enough. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great point, Jason. So when we started this company, Dr. Peter Mundy um, was one of the, one of our co-founders and he, if anybody knows Peter, he's a little bit of a stickler for the quiet phase. So um, we internally, our development team, we're talking about, Hey, can we use 300 milliseconds for the quiet phase? Can we use 500 milliseconds? Can we use 700 milliseconds? And um, Peter would not, bend on that whatsoever. It had to be a full second of quiet standing. And, and he pointed to research that he had done that showed that with a, a full second of quiet standing before initiation begins, you get significantly higher quality data. So uh, we just said, okay, we're gonna take your word for it. We're not the experts on, on that specific thing. So we're gonna go ahead and let you make that decision. Um, and that is literally how our software works. Not every, um, I don't know what every software's uh, threshold is or what what you know what kind of quiet phase they look for um, but because we're able to bring in data from other systems into our cloud we do get we do get large data sets from from teams and from from users and we often see uh, a little bit looser thresholds because there's a lot of tests that probably shouldn't have passed and when I say shouldn't have passed if that doesn't mean anything to you what it what I'm trying to describe is basically um, a test that wasn't performed correctly still gives an output of jump height for example um, when what ends up happening if you don't properly identify the initiation or if you don't have a solid threshold set in your software, you'll end up passing a lot of tests that otherwise should fail. That ends up with a lot of sort of, I would say, almost call them false positives where you say, okay, look, this athlete just jumped 62 centimeters with their hands and their hips. It's unbelievable. Wow, what an amazing jump. Um, you know, it's 10 centimeters higher than, you know, they've ever jumped before, but whatever. Um, if you're not in starting initiation at an actual moment when the athlete is not moving, you can actually inflate velocity and that ends up screwing your, your takeoff velocity uh, upwards. So it actually can, can skew it, not screw it, sorry. Um, and, and that can actually, that's actually a real problem. And, and it's not a problem of kind of how we do the math or anything like that. It's just a math problem. So um, we calculate the initiation based off of five standard deviations of that quiet phase. So and then we actually do a backward search. We kind of have like two things in there um, to ensure that it's done accurately. And even then there are some tests that can be a little bit iffy because the athlete's moving ever so slightly. There's also something important to note that there should be a quiet phase threshold, i.e. if an athlete moves a certain amount um, during that quiet phase, it's not a quiet phase, it's, it's they're moving. Um, so we could get the average of it and we'd probably be pretty close to body weight just by the nature of force plates, it's, it's very cool. But if they're moving when we think they're not moving, you know, the, the, the force plates are not, in, are not smart. Um, they're very dumb. They don't know, you know, an athlete's not moving. They don't know. You have to program all of that stuff. And, and we could definitely force a lot of tests to pass that would otherwise fail. But the end result is you're just going to end up with bad data. And we really, we really don't like seeing that because um, what's the utility in using a force plate or using any technology if you can't rely on the validity or the reliability of the data? It's, it's a big problem. So, um, for us, that's our approach. Uh, we we will fail tests if the quiet phase is not adhered to. And I think it's, um, you know, anybody, any users of our system know that certain athletes have a hard time. But I think the the real takeaway we want to provide today is that 
um, learn to do the test correctly, you're never going to have an issue. Yeah. It's really that time, simple. Uh, time and energy really wisely invested. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, what we find is sometimes people will, you know, and a lot of times it's, it's our failing, right? We're not doing a good enough job explaining or training or, or teaching users um, how to do things. Um, so the way I look at it is, okay, we need to provide more information, i.e., you know, we could do webinars, we can do blog posts about it, but um, I think it's just, uh, it's really, really critical, as Jason said, to ensure that you are, your athletes are not moving before the test begins. And I know that sometimes you just have certain, certain athletes that just refuse to sit still. Um, that's fine. You can still get good data with them. We've done it. I've tested enough athletes all the way from middle schoolers. My five-year-old daughter yesterday jumped about 50 times. She just kept wanting to jump. Um, and even she can hold steady. So, um, and, and that's, you know, that's jump a lot of me as well. Probably. Um, no. um, so, so I think, you know, the real emphasis we want to make is just, you know, learn how to do it correctly and you won't have issues down the road. Um, there are lots of things that can happen that can impact your data, the quality of your data. Um, by the way, we're going to, we're going to finish the PowerPoint and then we're going to go straight to a, a yeah, Ben, I do have that for you. Sorry, uh, somebody just asked if we have a detailed protocol for each test. Um, if you're a user of ours, absolutely. We can send that to you. We should have already. If you don't have it, we will ensure that you do. Um, but yes, that's absolutely something that we provide. Sorry about that. And what we're going to do after we finish the PowerPoint is we're basically going to go to a question and answer session. And I encourage anybody who has questions, we're going to get to as many of them as we can. I'm going to type them out. And then Jason and I uh, will do our best to answer them. Um, but again, the idea is that if you do it right the first time, you know, you don't have to retest. Um, other things to consider, you know, how often should we test, right? That's another question we always hear from coaches when they, when they start testing with force plates. And um, I'll go back into the quiet phase thing in a minute. Um, as often as you can, to be honest with you. I think the key is, A, you, you're consistent in your timing. You have a standardized warm-up protocol that you do every time. Because, you know, what we're doing when we're testing our athletes is, you know, we're trying to run many experiments. We're trying to get quality data. And one of the things we need to do is we need to control for as much as we possibly can. Um, I understand and we're very aware of, you know, the constraints of real world, right? You're in a, you're in a weight room. The music is blasting. 45 athletes you need to test in a short period of time. Are you certain that every single one of them has done the warm-up correctly? Probably not. But... Um, building a culture around, hey, test, let's get some feedback, providing some feedback to the athletes will only encourage them to want to do those warm-ups, to want to do the testing itself um, that much more. We, we see that all the time. Um, so I think you can really build something positive out of a testing protocol, out of a, a testing um, process. And, and we have some users that test all the time. They test every week, they test every day, some, some basketball teams, which to me is amazing. Um, they have tremendous amounts of data. And just for reference for everybody here, the only thing that we track in terms of what users are doing is um, a general tests completed and test type. So we can see how many tests our system processes on a daily, on a monthly, on a weekly, whatever basis. And right now it's between two to 4,000 per day. Um, so we've cut tested, we've collected, I don't know, let's say half a million tests in the last year. Um, it's a lot of tests. We have a lot of people testing very, very regularly. It's going up and up and up. Um, and we love to see it. But with each, you know, with each one of those, you know, the more you're testing, right, the more important it is that if you, if you do things right from day one, you're never going to have, hopefully, any issues. Um, if you're a user, obviously, one of the things that we really emphasize to our users is just, you know, reach out to us. If you have questions about, hey, am I doing this correctly? I'm seeing this data. This doesn't look right. Is there something wrong? Is there something wrong with the hardware? Is it something I'm doing? Um, we're here as a resource for our users. That's a, a huge, huge part of what we strive to do. Um, Ah, so Eric, Eric asks, what type of standardized warmup do we recommend? Well, that is something we don't recommend. I, I usually will put somebody in touch with another user that I know has an established warmup protocol um, because, you know, I think part of being trying to do a good job is knowing what you don't know and, and knowing when to hand that off. So um, that is something we don't necessarily hand out uh, because I think at the end of the day, this technology is is a tool for you to use. But at the end of the day, we're we're not coaches. We, you guys are the coaches, right? So um, we want to encourage coaches to use their creativity, to use their um, knowledge and experience to build a, a warm up, to build that protocol, to kind of build that testing program that fits what they're trying to do. And, and we try to make our system accommodate that rather than just say like, hey, here's our standardized warm up. This is what you have to do. Like we don't we don't take that approach. 
Um, maybe we should, I don't know. I'm totally open to it. If that's something that, that you know, our users would, would benefit from or think would be useful, we're, we're more than happy to provide it. And again, it's a situation where we wouldn't, I wouldn't come up with that myself, right? I would, I would outsource that, that thinking to somebody who knows a lot more um, than I do and, and try to put that into a, a simple warm up, you know, document that we could send along with systems. I'm, I'm open to doing that, but currently we'll typically talk to one of our users. We have a couple of people uh, on staff there that were customers or are customers that have been customers at some point who can help us with answering those types of questions. But typically I, I try not to, to do those myself because I just don't want to give people bad. Um, okay, so another another good question from Brett. How reliable will my data be if we use plates on the second floor of a building? Well, I can tell you right now that it depends on the plates. Um, we are on the third floor or second floor, of, I guess technically the third floor of a building right now. We test on wooden floors, which is like a big no-no. Um, and we test on like a, a soft mat. It's totally dependent on your hardware. Um, noise noise is something to consider. Filtering, there's a, we could go on for hours um, about filtering alone. However, I would say um, it, it should be fine. I mean, these, you know, our plates are portable. We, we provide a portable system. So therefore, you know, we expect our plates to be used in, um, you know, sort of a real world setting where you don't have an ingram set up, you're not set up on cement, but in a perfect world, everybody's got their force plates in ground, et cetera. I just think, rea you know, reality is what it is. Most, mm -hmm. most gyms, most facilities can't, can't always plan for that. So, um, I, again, it depends on your hardware. Uh, that's a really, it's a really good question though, because I have seen situations where uh, we're testing internally on wooden floors. We test over like we have big beams. This is an old mill building here and we, we get really good data. Uh, we get high quality data. I test um, on all kinds of different surfaces. We also have some very, very flat surfaces in here that are made of granite that we can test on um, purely because that's, you know, how we're calibrating. So um, yeah you can get noise. Certain force plates will be really noisy. Um, it really depends on, again, your hardware and, you know, what type of filtering you're applying. Um, if you have ground, more... Sorry, it, even even ground force plates will have noise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've seen situations, we've done, I've done gate labs in the past where they're measuring really, you know, very precisely and like electrical wiring in the ground can cause noise. There's all kinds of magnetic and you can get all kinds of stuff um, with our force plates though. I can only speak for those. Um, you shouldn't have any issues testing on, on unstable surfaces on different floors. Obviously you want to be on the flattest surface as possible. I think that, that goes without saying, um, maybe not, maybe I should have emphasized that more. Uh, however, you know, as long as you're, you're setting the plates up, as long as they have some mechanism of re-zeroing, as long as you can re-zero the plates when you move them, those are the types of things that we we would I would say in terms of um, quality of the data on a second level. There's a lot of as as like every question. There's a lot of um, a lot of things that can go into it. Okay. Yes. Kevin asks if we recommend keeping the surface consistent. I know. Yep. I spoke to. Yep. About a basketball team testing on the court. Definitely. Keep With our consistent. plates. So yeah. so speaking on on you know, about our force plates, I can say that there should not be an issue testing from like a hard gym floor to a basketball court. You shouldn't see any difference. We test on multiple surfaces before we ship every plate out so that we know that the readings are consistent and that the weights are consistent. It's reading the same force. Um, but initially when you set up, if you set up on a new surface, it's recommended you re-zero the plates and let them settle for a little while. Um, Jason, if you want to, I mean, ideally you want to keep it consistent every time, but real world is what it is. Absolutely. I think unless you go from really extremes, so from one extreme to another, I think you're going to be absolutely fine. But if you can keep it consistent, do it. If not, aim for as close to, to what you're using normally as you can. Yeah, simple. That's a good answer. All right. So got a little bit sidetracked. I, I love the question. So I definitely encourage people to keep asking them. Um, that really should drive the content more because it's really honestly how we develop our system. We don't do it all ourselves. We listen to what people people ask and we, we try to answer those questions before they ask them. So talking more about the quiet phase, this is, uh, Jason can talk more about this, this particular slide. This is from one of his papers. Um, so if you look at these two figures, the figure on the left is data from the figure on the right, believe it or not. And so all we've done is we've zoomed in to get a, a much better understanding of how noisy what appears to be a really quiet, quiet phase is, and then how we can 
use that information to, to figure out what our start threshold should be. So all we've done is we've averaged these ground reaction force over the first one second. That gives us their body weight for that particular jump. And we do this on a jump by jump basis rather than relying on a scale mass. And then we're looking for the largest force within that quiet standing period. We want to know whether it's greater than the body weight, i.e. the average of one second force, plus five standard deviations also calculated from this one second of standing still. If it is, then we're looking uh, for a force threshold that's going to be gr greater than five standard deviations. If it's not, then we're looking for a, um, a threshold that's going to be less than five standard deviations of that mean force. And so if we look here for this example, you can see on the left that the mean force was 781.96 newtons and so our maximum force was less than the mean force plus five standard deviations from that quiet phase and so actually um, the starting threshold was 774.43 newtons so we can locate that and then as ben, uh, ben suggested just now we then sort of backward search to that last instance of body weight occurring and that's essentially so what we're going to have then is where the threshold breaks five standard deviations whether it's plus or minus that's where that movement actually starts so that's the definition of when the movement begins however we backtrack to where the last instance of body weight is so we can actually work on the assumption that our athlete is still st uh, standing still and that's absolutely critical to get or to be able to integrate our force time data effectively and accurately Nice, perfect. Yeah, so I, um, people are asking about noise and we've actually gotten a lot of uh, questions about, you know, what is acceptable level of noise. It's gonna vary wildly depending on your hardware, depending on how big your plates are, depending on what technology your plates are using, what amplification. I mean, we, the, electronic, the electronic bit of, of things can get really um, complex. So I'll, I'll avoid doing that. Um, also the, the test type as well. Yeah, great point. Um, so what I think is interesting about this, these two figures though, is that, you know, as Jason said, this looks like a perfectly flat line, right? So if you look at that, you think, wow, it's beautiful. But if you get to a certain level of zoom, it, it looks hideous. And that's just what elect electrical signals look like. So if you perform a test and you notice that, hey, it, it you know, you see a wave like this, that's, that's normal. Um, how much that wave deviates is really what determines how, how noisy it is. Um, got another question. How much more reliable is the five standard deviation thresholds compared to other methods? Jason, do you want to elaborate on that at all? Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a question of reliability. It's just a question of accuracy. I would argue that, I mean, we've oh, I mean, I were talking about this for the last five and a half years, but I've been working on this review of the different methods that we've used to analyze force time data from the counter moving jump. And um, without question, I would say it's the only method the only different methods that match this in terms of accuracy, bearing in mind we know that if we use this five standard devi deviation approach, we've got a one in 30 million chance of movement not actually occurring at that point. So that's, you know, that for me, that's the, the level of sort of certainty we want to be working towards. The only other methods we've found that get close to that are um, 1.75 and three times the largest residual within that quiet standing as well. But then, then we're drifting down um i guess terms that not everybody might necessarily understand but essentially i think you have to consider that signal noise and you have to consider it to an extent that any change in force or any point that you um essentially say this is where they that the movement starts you have to be as as confident as you possibly can and so i think the five standard deviation approach is about as robust as we can get yeah and i think as a as a general rule and Jason and I talk about this all the time. Jason hates arbitrary thresholds, right? He hates arbitrary, oh, 10 newtons, 15 newtons. Um, because that's not to say that's not to say I haven't used them in the past. No, right, 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 of course. But um, I think it's a good point. I think you know, understanding that each athlete's body will respond differently and will react differently on a force plate. If you have a method of calculate or a threshold that takes that into account, you're yeah, you're doing better. Right, because if it's just an arbitrary 25 newtons or, or whatever, um, yeah, you have you run the risk of starting integration at the wrong time, et cetera. There's lots of issues that come up with that. So I have another question here. I'm going to quickly, um, I'm probably, I'll let Jason handle this one because we've talked about it quite a bit, but 
bimodal versus unimodal force time curve. So we're talking about the actual shape of the curve, right? So yeah. is it a force curve that looks like this one here on the right, or is it a force curve that looks, let me see, sorry, I've got the chat covering everything here. Or is it one that looks more like, I don't know, was that, no, that was definitely unimodal. Yeah, a little bit yeah. bimodal, no, not yeah. really. So he's talking about kind of if, if there's a hump at the top um, of the trace. It can. But I think, and again, this is going to sound terribly like I'm, I'm trying to dodge a question. I'm really not. I think it depends. Most of my answers which should always begin with, it depends, apart from the five standard deviation one. Uh, and whether or not squiggly lines are fun, because of course they are. Uh, but from a bimodal and unimodal perspective, I would argue that I think we're perhaps putting a little bit too much energy into that at the moment as, as, a, as a research, you know, as researchers and perhaps even as, as practitioners. Um, I think they can be useful, but more importantly, I think you need to understand the strategy that enables that athlete to actually um, display that unimodal or bimodal curve. And then you can start thinking about what the differences are. So whether or not the unimodal or bimodal curve is related to, say, fatigue or the effects of training or competition, I'm going to put myself out on a limb here and say probably not. I'd like to be proved so wrong, but I'm going to say probably not. So the second part of the question, which I didn't get to, because Jason just immediately started talking, was the uh, whether or not uh, is the trace dependent on the specific sport, for example, a, uh, a concentric, pr primarily concentric driven sport like skiing versus a sport that has large eccentric forces, i.e. alpine skiing. These are not my words, I'm just literally reading. Um, so I think Jason partially answered that. I what I've I'm seen just based no. on experience yeah. is no, it's primarily based on the athlete. And it also is based on the, a lot, a lot, there, there's a lot of factors that go mm. into it, right? So um, how they're feeling on a given day, fatigue levels, uh, what's been going on, if there's, there's any type of issue going on, um, what type of training you've been focused on, et cetera. I think all of that can, can lead into it. I think typically what I've noticed in testing, we test here almost every single day, um, Everybody kind of has their sort of normal, I would say, quote unquote, uh, trace. Some people are slightly different. Some people are, have a, sort of a unique a, a unique look to their trace. But generally, we, we kind of ignore that. Um, it's, it's tempting to try to pull something out of that. But I just haven't seen the research. And I think Jason agrees. There is some research on it. I know there's some papers that I've seen. Um, I just haven't, I haven't dug really into them very deeply. So it's not a great answer, Greg. I, I apologize I, for that. Um, I, I think we could probably add a bit of a caveat to that in as much as if the guys you're working with consistently demonstrate a particular um, bimodal or unimodal force time curve shape, and then that suddenly changes, then that might be something that you want to investigate a little bit more deeply. But I think in general, it's probably not something to, to spend too much energy thinking about. Perfect. Okay. I've got two more questions here before we, before we jump forward. So Jonathan's asking about weighing, uh, weighing and noise in the squat jump. It's a really good question. Um, exactly. Do the weighing standing, uh, do, do, do you weigh in quote unquote standing or in the squat, squat position in this situation? Is the five standard deviation threshold also useful? Uh, yes, we weigh in, in our, our protocol, our system, the way it works is you get the athlete gets into the squat position, you begin the test, after a second, it beeps to let you know it's got the full second. Athlete performs the movement. Squat jump has got other issues with it that we can talk about if, if we have time, but um, we do it the exact same way. The squat jump is the exact same thing as a counter movement jump. We just don't have an unweighting phase. Um, and, and the breaking phase and the unweighting phase have already occurred before the test begins. So um, everything else is the same. Everything is calculated the same. Um, displacement obviously never goes negative, except on landing. Um, it just you're starting at a lower position, so it's a, a very different test in terms of how it's done, how it's set up. But that's that's really interesting. I think um, our the way our software works is that you literally get the athlete in the position, hit play. I'm guessing there's softwares that you know you weigh in initially and then get into position. I'm not really sure, um, but that's just not how our our particular system works. Jason, anything to add to that? Um, no, I, I would say the bottom line is that the, the data you get is only going to be as good as the effort you put into standardizing your protocol. And part of that standardization should be having your athlete squat 
rest for at least three seconds and then you begin that test. So that quiet standing phase is them in the squat position because that's essentially what's going to affect the noise of the data. Nice. Yeah. And, and you, you'll probably will notice, especially with younger athletes, we've tested, we've done a lot of combines, worked with a lot of high schools, et cetera. And, you know, younger athletes will have a harder time really holding out squat position and, and being really still learning squat position. That's why the five standard deviations is, again, useful. You won't get a false uh, initiation early or anything like that. But one thing to consider that's unique about the squat jump versus the counter movement jump is um, if the athlete unweights, the squat jump assumes that it's it's a it's a flat line and then it goes right to propulsive. So if you have an athlete actually moving negatively before um, and it's it passes as a squat jump, even though it's really counter movement jump, that's going to massively impact the results of that jump uh, of the calculation. Right. So that's an example of where a proper integration time is is a proper integration threshold is essential. Otherwise, you will start getting wildly inflated squat jump numbers. Um, we have seen countless countless younger athletes, I mean, even, even adults, um, professionals, even having a hard time performing the squat jump without a counter movement. It's, it's, it's different. It's challenging for some athletes. I, I've seen it a, a lot. Um, so that's something to just to, to be aware of. It's a, it's a totally different animal. Once an athlete understands how to perform it, really connects with that. Um, it's one of my takeaway points at the end. We'll, we'll actually cover that. I think it's really important for coaches who are, who are running athletes through a squat jump to actually perform the squat jump test and, and fail some squat jump tests to understand. We use a body weight um, for our, our failed you know, counter movement if it's greater than a certain percentage. So it's essentially a, a comparable way to doing it. It's a percentage of that quiet phase. Um, if they dip below a certain percentage, um, it fails the test. And we, we had a looser percentage initially when we first released our app. The end result were a lot of tests and by looser, I mean, I think it was like 8% of body weight or something. Um, if you're a thousand newtons, that's 80 newtons. So if they unweight 80 newtons, boom, failed. Even an unweighting of 50 newtons at a, for a 1,000 um, newton athlete is going to give them an inflated jump height big time. It's, it, it's very sensitive. That's the integration. Okay, next question. Hope, hopefully we answered that. Um, Considering we're, this is from Adam, considering we're discussing the best practices surrounding the utilization of force platforms within sport performance, do you have any talk recommendations regarding particular parameters that seem to be leading slash early indicators for both neuromuscular fatigue and or um, plus or minus performance adaptation regarding the counter movement jumps? So just so happens we have a blog post on that. Yeah, we do have a blog post on that. Um, Adam, it's a great question, and, and it's you know it's one of the main, it's one of the most common questions that we get. Are what metrics should I be looking at? There's there's a lot of uh, research out there for sure. What I think is important is understanding your your individual setup, your individual athletes, your individual system, and whether you have the tools to track changes over time. I think um, there is no magic pill, unfortunately, to say hey, if this value goes down, the athlete is getting more fatigued. It's um, another one of these multi-layered answers, which nobody seems to like, and I completely understand. Um, <laughs> it, there are, there's a lot of things that you can look at to determine whether or not an, uh, a fatigue is setting in um, or whether performance, you know, whether your athletes are adapting to, to training, et cetera. It's a mixed bag. There's, um, and it there's a lot of things. Population to population and all, right? Yeah, and that's that's kind of my, my initial point is, you know, it depends on your your situation, what type of athletes you're working with, um, how often you're testing, right? So if you test too much, I think, or if you test too frequently, you might you might see things that aren't necessarily there from day to day. But, you know, hopefully if you're doing a proper statistical analysis, that stuff will, will you know, iron out in the wash or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. I, I, is there, you know, are there certain things that are better than others? Well, I can tell you right now, there's a lot of things that you can calculate that all essentially mean the exact same thing. So um, whether it's my favorite particular metric or, or somebody else's is, is irrelevant, I think. Um, it comes down to picking metrics you can A, comprehend, and B, um, actually monitor over time effectively. So things that you can, you know, I think it's important to ensure that you're looking at metrics and, and calculations that are um, something you can actually explain. That might sound ridiculous, but it, I see it a lot. We hear it a lot. People, people, you know, they, they have an idea, they want to do something, they want to do it a certain way because they've heard it done that way. 
um, but they don't they don't fully understand it. And so our previous webinar and, and a lot of what Jason's done. Um, sorry, I've got another question coming in. Uh, a lot of what a lot of what Jason has done is try to help to sort of sort that out for users just to say, look, we can look at a lot of things, but you need to know why you're looking at a certain thing. Um, yeah, take ownership of your data. Otherwise, how are you going to be able to apply it effectively to your athletes? Yeah, so I know that's not the best question, Adam. I apologize for that, but I'm happy to chat with you another time or, you know, have a call or whatever and, and talk about some of the stuff that we've seen internally. I'm just not, um, you know, there are, there are people a lot smarter and a lot more experienced than myself that I would probably put you in touch with if, if you had specifics that, you know, you wanted to, to ask about I'm more than happy to do that. Like that's what we're here for. So the next question, um, okay, can we compare the squat jump to the counter movement jump? Can we compare two test types? Yes, we can. We have a couple different reports um, that allow you to do that. So, the, well, we actually have one that's really designed for that. It's the athlete profile. So we, we basically give you the ability to put data in for an athlete um, looking at metrics from different test types to try to look at like sort of a holistic picture of how the athlete is performing. Um, you might be doing isometric and then pull, squat jump, counter movement jump, and you want to bring certain metrics from each one of those into the sort of into the, the equation. We can do that. Um, one of the one of the issues with comparing things from um, metrics from different test types beyond something like a, a jump height, right? So there's the eccentric utilization ratio. I know that's pretty commonly done where you're just looking at jump height from the counter movement jump versus a squat jump, you know, how much is an athlete benef benefiting from that um, additional eccentric phase here. Um, you know, how elastic is that athlete, et cetera. That's one way, one thing you can very easily look at. Um, we're actually building some really cool stuff specifically for this. So yes, there is a current, and, and Michael asked this question, if we allow this, Michael's a user, so I'm, I'm happy to, email you some, some info, Michael, it's actually a new report we released last week. So um, the answer is yes. Um, also with our software, you can always export your data um, to Excel and, and look at it that way. And now the next question, oh, it looks like there's a few others. Okay, cool, just a little check. Um, is there a document or previous webinar where we can see the calculations behind each metric? I appreciate the glance over. Noise before jumping. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we're working on a, a paper, hopefully we'll publish sometime in the summer, um, literally describing the methodology that we personally, our, our company uses to calculate every metric that we calculate. It's, I mean, we have that documentation, but we need to put it into a format that is um, readable. <laughs> a lot of it is, Dave asked a good question too. Um, a lot of it is, um, pretty straightforward, but there's there's a few things that we just have to kind of translate because all of it's in code. Um, okay, next one. So yes, that will be published hopefully in the summer. Um, okay, a couple of different things here. I'm gonna just jump in. Is there a way to automatically pull data into another analysis software like Excel? Yeah, we actually have an API in our software um, that you can set up to literally pull it wherever you wanna pull it. Um, we also have obviously the ability to export raw data from your from your system, um, and I, again, I can only speak for our system. That's that's important. Um, we emphasized that in the previous webinar. I was just talking about look, owning your data also um, also involves having access to your data, right? That's important. Um, okay, Dave, happy to uh, for the API. Dave's asking if there's a tutorial on how to do the API. Absolutely, I can I can totally walk you through that. Um, Okay, so another great question. Since there are different baselines, baseline during squat jump may have more noise than baseline from counter movement jump. Is it correct to compare squat jump to a CMJ? Um, uh, good question, Jason. What would you say? Is it? Um, I would say yes, absolutely, because you can consider that part of the skill of the squat jump, just as much as the counter movement jump is a skill as well. The more the guys do it, or you know, the more your athletes get to do these tests and yourself. Anybody you work with, the more they do these tests, the better they'll get at it, the more solid their technique will become. Um, you know, we've, we've routinely seen guys with their squat jumps who can actually hold a, a quieter, quiet standing phase than they can in the counter movement jump. Nice. All right. Thank you, Jason. All right. So before 
we get inundated with additional questions and, and I appreciate all the uh, input. Okay, so just to kind of summarize what we've talked about, you know, the quiet phase is important for a couple of different things. A, you get a quality, reliable body weight measurement. Um, people always ask, oh, we have force plates now, so we don't need to weigh in athletes. Well, if you have them jumping regularly, they're perf performing a proper uh, quiet standing phase, then no, you don't. Um, in fact, our new app will have a body weight report directly in the dashboard. Um, secondly, it's essential for an accurate calculation. And, and this applies not just to the counter movement jump, the squat jump, it also applies to our counter movement rebound, um, our isometric midline pull. So slightly different there. Um, something probably another webinar we could do. In fact, Jason and I planned that out before this uh, this one started. So we will be doing an isometric midline pull webinar with some leading men uh, in the near future. But um, the quiet <laughs> the quiet phase is, is really really important. Ensuring that the athlete is not moving, you get a good body weight measurement. Um, you also know that you can begin that integration at the right time when the athlete isn't moving. I could I could show you guys loads and loads of data of just bad quiet phases, but I'm going to spare you. It's it, it's it's tough. It's really tough. Um, and, and there's also always a trade-off in a software, right? Because you don't want to have every test failing because the athletes are moving. However, if it's a bad if it's a bad test and they are failing, then it should fail. And it we've always sort of navigated that gingerly and trying to be careful to to avoid essentially inflaming a lot of users to say like, hey, it's too tight. We can't get good, um, um, we can't get good squat jumps. Nobody can pass the squat jumps. I've seen, I mean, I've seen that at the NFL level a lot actually, where the athletes just are not able to perform a squat jump effectively. I think it's, again, it's, it's another, similar to the drop jump, one of the issues that, that you know you might encounter with the drop jump, which is another really great test, is that it's a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a learned skill and the squat jump applies there, but I wouldn't say that um, people can get better at a squat jump. It's more just, Hey, once they figure out how to do the movement, um, then it becomes a more useful test. And unfortunately, you know, because there's a slightly different learning curve for that. And for some athletes, um, you can run into issues there. So movement initiation threshold, we talked about that. Um, one thing to note, and I try to reinforce this frequently is that this is a standardized test. So, I know everybody, every every athlete, you know, D1, whatever, can jump 45 inches on their vertical jump test. We hear that literally every day. Um, you know, why are they only jumping, you know, 48 centimeters with their hands on their hips? And, and the difference is that this is not a vertical jump test by itself. This is not the same thing as a uh, three-step off one foot, um, hit the hit the vertex, which, you know, again, it's a different test. This is looking at so much more. We're not only looking at how high you can jump, um, there's also, there's actually some really interesting stuff about goal oriented jumps versus just jumping on a plate. For some athletes, it's going to be a weird sensation just standing on the middle of a plate in the middle of a room and jumping up. It's, it's not something that they're comfortable with. Um, the standardized, you know, this is not a vertical jump test alone. This is much more than that. Um, the more we can control for, the better. So, you know, make sure you get good quiet phases. Something I wanted to mention very briefly before we start answering more questions is just uh, recently we've 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 helped some some folks with some large data sets, and we've noticed, you know, there are protocols where you do five or six jumps in a in a single go. Um, we built a protocol to do that because people had asked us for it, and and what we found was that. Um, it might seem like it's, hey, it's saving us time. We just hit play once and they jump five times and 25 seconds later, we get, you know, all five jumps. And I tell you right now, it may not be um, that big of a time, that big of a time saver. <laughs> what we have found is that that protocol where there's no defined stop in between each test. I mean, we're talking about a half a second, right? To hit stop, save the data and hit play again, hit test again. Um, Honestly, it, there's something about resetting, having the athlete reset and begin again. It ensures that you get a good quiet phase. If they jump and then they land, they stabilize, they get back into position and they go again and it just automatically goes whenever. What we have begun seeing with these data sets is that they're not quiet in between jumps at all. And it, it's a mess. And that can be a problem when you're trying to standardize this. And then, you know, another reason we don't have a body weight input where you input the body weight before the jump goes and then who cares how quiet they are because we're just going to begin the integration whenever we know what they weigh. So what's, what's the issue? Well, the issue is that your velocity is going to be wildly wrong. And as an end result, you're going to find by um, the second or third jump, 
And depending on how you're doing the velocity integration, sorry, there's like a whole conversation going on in the chat, which is distracting me. Depending on how you're doing that integration, um, you might see athletes jumping a meter by the third jump when they were jumping 42 centimeters in the first jump, et cetera. Um, that kind of leads into another conversation about drift, which I, I would be happy to talk about if anybody has questions about drift. It's definitely important. Um, and Jason is just talking to a couple of folks about um, how to communicate to an athlete about the quiet phase. That's really good. That's really important. Um, I typically will have, so one thing, one thing that we always get is, hey, we can't seem to pass a squat jump with, with some of our athletes. What I'll tell people in our system is, hey, uh, set the test type to free run where you can just measure anything. Have them perform the squat jump and look at the trace. You know, if you perform a squat jump and it fails, our, our system says, you know, there's like a big red X and it's like bad test, you know, you kind of remove it or whatever. Um, but you still see the trace. Uh, determining how big that how big that dip is it, it can be helpful and it can also be really helpful for coaches to actually perform a squat jump themselves you know in in that free run mode to determine okay am i am i actually unweighting when i don't think i am um i've i've heard a lot of times hey they're not unweighting but they're failing the squat jump the only way you can fail the squat jump is by unweighting so it, it you might not even see it um, it's very hard to see it's like it's like that old adage of you know i don't need cameras i don't need video i can see you know, all this with my eyes or whatever. Uh, we see that a lot. It's, it's, it's understandable. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So Eric's just talking about, they, they do a 25 second rest interval between jumps. And, and I think something like that is nice. Um, if you have the time, if you're in a, in a situation where you don't have, you know, 50 athletes all going at once, um, a bunch of people are talking which is good. We like, we like, I really like the discussion and I would encourage everybody to, to ask questions. Um, another thing I'll add is there's no wrong questions. Nobody, um, one of the issues that I see in, in, I guess, tech around sports science is that everybody's sort of expected to be an expert and that's ridiculous. Um, what we try to do as a company is provide a, a system that's as foolproof as possible so that you don't have to be an expert. You can, you can be a coach and you can use, the skills and the knowledge that you have to to collect solid data and to use that data and to apply that data um, we want the the force plate the testing the technology part of it to be um, not a hassle let's put it that way um, so often it's the other way around so um, just to, to kind of back up some of the core ideas you know keep things simple you don't need to do all the tests at once it's another really important thing you might have the ability to do 75 different you know variations of tests with single leg with uh, multiple hops, et cetera. You know, you can do all that stuff. You can create tags and create all kinds of different tests in our system. Um, start simple. Start with something you can get your head around. This reiterates and reinforces what Jason had talked about last week is that, um, you know, start simple with, with both your test type, your test selection, and also your metrics, right? Keep things simple. Less is more in, in almost every case. Um, collect as often as you can. Again, the more data you can collect, the better. The more knowledge and more experience you can gain, the better. Um, Roberto just asked about a single leg counter movement jump. Uh, yeah, I mean it's a it's a different test. It's there's there's some there's some research on on single leg jumps. Um, even uh, more Jason, I don't know if you if you want to yeah. go ahead. Absolutely great, but even more skill required for the single leg jump. So if you're having problems getting your guys to stand still for the two footed jumps, the single leg legged jump is probably going to be a bit of a nightmare and probably something to avoid for them. Yeah, yeah, there, but there are certain athletes who, are, who can do it, who can do it just Absolutely. fine. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, no problem. Like with our, mm -hmm. with our particular system, you can just tag it left, left single leg, right single leg, whatever. Um, the calculations are identical. Uh, it's all the same thing. But again, you will find, for the most part, single leg is a lot harder. So presenting data, average of jumps versus the best jump. Uh, okay, that's a great, that's a really good question. Thank you, Anonymous. Um, what I would say is I, I personally, and, and we Internally, we like to use the average um, just because it, it can help, you know, you, again, you might have a single test that is an outlier. You might have a single test that is like exceptional and it could, you know, it could be exceptional because of a, an integration error. <laughs> could be exceptional because uh, of a million different things. I think um, the average of, of tests on a particular day is the way that our system works. So um, I, I think that method is, is really useful. Um, obviously, you know, if they have a best jump on a particular day, it's their best of all time or something like that, then, you know, that's going to impact their average and, and that will be reflected in their average. Jason, do you have any, any preference there in terms of how you um, present the data? Um, no, 
<laughs> and the other thing I would say is, it, again, it depends. It really depends on what you're looking at and why you're looking at it. Which I know, and it's terrible to start everything with, and it depends, but it's true. Anybody who sells you on absolutes is, is fibbing to you. Yeah. And it's all part of the sort of taking ownership of your data, which I think is okay, absolutely okay. key. I've got another good question. Um, in Alpine skiing, we're looking for the ability to maintain high level of power strength. Is the average RSI metric in 30 multi-rebound tests accurate to measure muscular endurance? Um, Q is jump as high and as fast as possible. Okay, so in our particular system, we have like a multi-rebound where you can literally just perform a series. Some people call it a pogo test. Pogo test, we ask them to call it a pogo, you know, multi-jumps, whatever. Um, in our particular protocol, we don't we don't integrate for that one because of a lot of a lot of concerns with mostly drift. But again, with that, you know, you can't actually reset in between tests the different measurement. Uh, what we do then is we use basically a running RSI calculation. So each test gets calculated a quick RSI flight time over contact time. It's a series almost of drop jumps if you're just doing a pogo. Um, is the average RSI metric for 30 multi-rebound tests accurate to measure muscular endurance? Um, ah, that's a great question. Um, I guess so. I mean, I think, I think it can be. If you're, if you're having, if you're queuing the athletes to jump 30 times, um, one of the things that we can do in the system is actually graph the RSI over time to see if it starts to decline. Um, depends. If you're really getting max effort, I think kind of something we should have stated in the beginning is that if you're not getting max effort from your athletes, um, you're going to have a hard time getting good data, period. Uh, max effort is everything. One of the issues that we have internally when we test here is that, you know, like I'm an old man, like my body hurts. I don't want to jump max effort every day. Uh, our developers, you know, they're, they're not uh, going all out every time we jump. And so we end up getting, you know, less than great data and you see a lot more noise in sort of our long-term trends and things like that. It's just nature of the beast. I think in, a, in an elite sports setting, you probably should be able to get more high quality data from your athletes. You should be able to get that max effort every time. Um, and if you are, I would say that a 30, 30 multi-round, 30 jumps might, might be high, but um, that's purely just my opinion. Jason, do you have any, any thoughts on that? um oh god here it goes again it depends <laughs> it really does and I, I, and, I, and I swear i'm not deliberately dodging the question it really does depend on what you're trying to get out of that particular test because the, the test itself and the data aren't magic so they'll give you the they basically present you with information that you then have to decipher so it's it really depends on what you're working with who you're working with what stage they're at where potentially they are within seas. There's so many different factors in it, and I think it can vary from time to time. So I think a short answer, you'll be amazed there is a short answer, is probably don't become so narrow-minded potentially that you just you focus on just trying to use one test all the time. It may not be the best approach. Yeah, we'd say experiment, and this kind of reiterates the third, the, the fourth point, yeah. Uh, the fourth point here is that um, test yourself. You know, if you have four splits, you have access to four splits and you're a coach. Um, I cannot recommend enough to actually perform the tests yourself regularly. It will help to reinforce a lot of the concepts as you start to track your own data, as you start to see changes in your own performance and in certain metrics. It's a really, really simple way to reinforce a lot of the stuff that, that we're talking about here. Jump, 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 and, and really change your strategy deliberately. See how that impacts the results and the output metrics. That's going to be um, a really powerful tool if you're just trying to, um, you know, gain gain a little bit deeper insight. There's nothing, you know, you can really feel the changes rather than just observing them. And I think that's really Absolutely. important. Yeah. It's one of the ways we always train. We onboard new teams, new new schools, et cetera. As we'll spend time, you know, testing the coach, having the coaches test themselves, especially if we're on site, gives them the opportunity to to do a you know high RFD test or whatever and see. Um, okay, um, sorry, there's so much conversation here. It's very uh, interesting. Um, actually, you know, you can actually see those changes in real time and, and determine, okay, was that you know, an effective strategy? Did I jump higher or did I just produce a higher RFD? And you know, is that a fluffy metric or whatever, as Jason might say? Uh, a couple more questions. Um, okay, best test for basketball athletes. Uh, I really like. I really like the counter movement jump for, for basketball. I also like the drop jump. Um, personally, Amanda asked that. Um, Drake 
has some good experience on that as well. But I, I think, you know, for basketball specifically, um, counter move and jump, you kind of, you kind of hit all the points. You measure kind of all the types of contraction. Um, and then with a drop jump, it really measures, you know, their ability to react quickly and get back off the floor, which, you know, in basketball applies a ton, right? How quickly can you get set? You can't always get perfectly set. So it's really about applying as much force as quickly as possible, but at the same time, so is the kind of movement jump. So the nice thing about the drop jump, um, you can really hone in on that kind of reactivity uh, measure. And you can also train with that. You can really very easily train with the drop jump. Jason, do you have a, a recommendation for um, particularly like sports specific for basketball? Oh, I think your answer was perfect. Oh, of course. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so kind. I mean, I hope that, I hope that helps. Um, basketball, we have a lot of basketball users. We have a lot of teams that test. Um, and, and yeah, they all pretty much stick to the counter movement jump and, and I would say drop jump, but I, but I also think there's value in doing isometric testing if you can, mm -hmm. um, if you have yeah. the setups for it. Um, counter movement rebound, as Eric mentioned, is, is a good idea as well. Counter movement rebound is a great test. Counter movement rebound um, is literally a, a counter movement jump. And then on the landing, instead of landing and stabilizing, you pop back up again. So it kind of, it's like a double jump. And I think it's a really good test. It's something that we um, add into the system based on uh, an idea from it. I think it was a potential user. I don't even think it was a user at the time. And, and it just kind of made sense. John McMahon talks about it a lot and calls it the buy one, get one free test. Buy one, get one free. Nice. Yeah. yeah that's, I like that. I should, I should use that and steal that. Um, okay. So, Amanda, I hope that was helpful. Definitely encourage you to reach out. Amanda, we'd love to, love to connect with you once the um, travel restrictions die down we'd love to get down down to see you guys um again uh okay michael asked a question dr lake's thoughts on the counter movement jump versus squat jump as a global measure of fatigue and how that might compare to possible peripheral measures of fatigue hand dynamometry to clarify when okay when would you expect a divergent between the two large enough that you would want to attempt to measure them independently um so michael your question being measuring the two i, I don't know one, that i fully really yeah. understand it it's, Jason, either, yeah. make... it's either whether or not one of those the cmj or the sj is going to give you a, a better global or more accurate or, or meaningful measure of um fatigue or whether or not differences between them which is i think is what it goes on to say differences between them when they get to a certain point do you sort of put the brakes on and say, well, okay, there's a certain type of training we need to implement now to, to correct that or whatever. Um, I would always argue that both of those jumps um, are a skill, as I mentioned earlier, but also if you think about the squat jump, you could almost consider that more of a, a more blunt tool because it is. So that's not to say it's not skilled because you have to be skilled to perform it well, but it's also quite blunt. You've got the opportunity to get less data from it. So with the counter movement jump, you can actually look at the, the strategy. So from a fatigue perspective, I think rather than focusing on the force metrics a lot of the time, you probably need to look at the timing metrics to see how that's actually interfered, if it has interfered, that particular element of performance, because you can potentially um, have several different people at several different levels of fatigue achieve their consistent jump heights. However, how they achieve those jump heights can vary wildly and I think that's probably the most important thing. Uh, another thing between def uh, deciding whether or not you want to use the counter movement jump or the squat jump is also probably going to come down to how or, or what typical movement strategy the athletes you're working with will use in a typical element of their sports performance. So what's, you know, think about the specificity. Nice. Hope that was a good answer. So one of the things that we wanted to do at the end was maybe do some some live demonstrations, um, a couple of jumps, things like that, just so people can see what um, the differences are. Um, we are looking to standardize kind of push up testing. On the, oh yeah, that's Michael. That's a great question. So um, how, doing a push up test on the plates. Um, is there a way to standardize it? So we, this is this is great because we've we've had this a lot. We've done this quite a bit. Um, if you look at a push up, like a plyo push up, where you actually leave the ground, um, it's basically the exact same movement as a counter movement jump. And you can literally use the counter movement jump protocol to pass a test as a push up. In fact, I can do that for everybody in a second. You can see it come in in real time. 
Uh, one of the issues with it is that it's, it's challenging to get the body weight correct, i.e. how much weight are you actually throwing on your upper body versus your toes? Is there a way to minimize that? And I think that is the challenge, Michael. Um, and your question is how, how can we do that? Um, is there a way to do that? Is it possible? And I think there is, we just have not figured it out. <laughs> I think um, for the honestly. time being, one way to potentially look at it is as long as your setup is always consistent, is to maybe look at it from a more generic approach and just think about the flight time element of it, for example. That works. Something we'd, all, we'd, all, we'd always ask people to sort of, you know, avoid that with, with jumping. But I think where you've got um, not all of your body mass starts on that, on the plates, I think the, the, the flight time option gives you a, a pretty good idea as long, or it could give you a pretty good idea. It'd certainly be worth playing with potentially. Yeah, that's that's a really great that's a really great call, Jason. So, um, one of the things to to ensure, Michael, if you are doing counter movement jump, you're doing push ups on the plates, um, and you are doing them as a counter movement jump, is to ensure that I'm just going to set up our plates here really quickly. If anybody's interested, um, is to ensure that you are tagging your tests and identifying your tests correctly. So, one of the things that our our system allows for is a, a tag. You know, because one of the things that we do, you're doing all these different types of tests. All of them have some element of body weight. Um, there's it's measuring your body weight, right? Squat jump, counter movement jumps, counter movement rebound. So we are automatically updating every athlete's body weight in the in the back end of our of our cloud. So when you go and do a push up, and they're only putting 70% of their body weight as a totally random number I'm throwing out there, uh, it's not going to be right, and it's actually going to bring down their average body weight. So the one thing you want to be sure that you're doing is if you are doing push-ups as the, with the counter movement jump protocol, ensure that you're, you're using an excluded tag. So in our back end, I can create tags and there's quite a few on this account, but if I go to a push, -up, which I think we have somewhere here, um, where is the push-up? Yeah. So push-up is here. Um, we have this push-up tag and it says exclude weight true. So what that means is that um, with this specific, oh, John's here, nice, welcome. Um, the legend, John McMahon. Um, one of the things about uh, excluding the, the, the weight is that you're basically saying anytime we do this particular test that has this tag applied, don't put it into the running calculation for body weight. And that's really important. That's the only thing you really need to be certain of then you never need to worry about the body weight. Um, if they're resting a certain percentage of their body weight on the plates when the test is performed, then yeah, I mean, it's, it, yeah, there's issues with it, but I think it, it can still give you valuable data. As Jason mentioned, even just looking at something like uh, flight time and or asymmetry and or um, average force during the various phases. I mean, all of that stuff is still gonna be relevant. Um, the one thing that obviously is not going to be is a consistent body mass. So that's that can be problematic. And that same concept of tagging tests correctly applies when you are doing um, weighted jumps of any kind, right? So if you're, you've got a bar on somebody's back, you wanna be sure that you're um, doing that correctly, you're, you're excluding that weight and or you're using a tag that has the weight automatically excluded, um, that kind of thing. So really quickly here, um, if it makes sense, if anybody wants to see, I'm happy to do a couple of, a couple of jumps here. Um, different types of people want to see it. I'm not sure if that's something people are interested in. Um, if not, no big deal. I'm, I'm a little bit sore anyway. Um, but, hi. <laughs> um, yeah, notorious for, for not wanting to do more than I have to these days. Um, okay, so what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm just logged into my, um, to my cloud. I'm on our mobile app here. I have some plates behind me. I'll switch cameras at some point. You guys can all see it. Um, and I can do some jumps. Um, there's our plates. They're, they're in a little foam surround here. And that foam surround is yeah, just surrounding the plates. It's just really a, a safety thing. Okay. Squat jump plus. What is the use of tester? Okay. So I can do a couple squat jumps if people would like to see. Um, just because we can kind of try to reinforce what we're talking about here. You might, what you might notice is a slightly different body weight because of the noise. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and do, um, so I'm just going to get a, a static measurement here on the plates. Just I'm using our free run test. One second. 
brand new device. Jason, do you want to try to answer that question that was just asked while I'm getting everything rolling? Um, let's have a look. Where are we? Do you also measure the? I'll be honest with you. I'm not entirely sure what you mean by a squat jump plus test. If you could just clarify that and try and answer your question a little bit more. But I, I think one of the things you might, might want to focus on at the moment is what on earth is Ben doing and how on earth can he start his force plate recording while he's stood nowhere near the computer? Is it magic? <laughs> is it witchcraft? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I just did a static measurement just to get a, a rough estimate of my body weight. Hopefully I wasn't moving too much. And um, now what I'm going to do is I'll do a counter movement jump. So I'm, I'm on our mobile app here. And actually, maybe one of my colleagues can run the run the system. They're, they should all be listening. It's assigned. So go ahead, stand right there. Yes, out of frame. <laughs> so we we recommend hands on hips. This is another sort of best practices. Um, and what we've done is we've created a tag with for arm swing, and I think that's um, really up to you. But we just recommend that as a really easy way. If, you, if we do like a couple different tests with arm swing versus uh, hands on hips, we'll see a wide, a wide difference. Um, and also for reference, I have not warmed up at all. So if I hurt myself, that's my fault. Mm -hmm. Go. Yep, go ahead and save it. All right, so just do the counter movement jump. That'll be in the cloud in just a second. And then I'll also do a squat jump now. Just save it, please. All right. So, oh, didn't sound it sounds good. like someone's been shot. <laughs> hey, we're in America after all. <laughs> um, all right. So, yeah, that didn't feel great. I can't, I can't lie about that. So, I did a couple different jumps, as everybody saw. Uh, the first one was this counter movement jump, and you can see I jumped 42 centimeters. I dropped 36 centimeters. My RFD was 48.60 newtons per second. Um, you know, we have all the metrics here that we can look at. Um, I can review this data in real time. I can just quickly look at the velocity if I want to. It seemed like I stabilized at the end, and as we get towards the end, my velocity comes right around zero. Um, but we're there. From this, what I have the ability to do in, in our particular system, and this is, um, you know, as I said, we can only talk for our system, but I have the ability to right away determine, you know, in context, how did, how did I perform on this particular jump? So my system weight's 949. The last 60 days, my mean system weight, my mean body weight has been 963. So people also ask like, hey, you know, the first jump I did was, or the first test I did was 951. Oh, nice. That's what we want. We want things to crash when we're sharing our screen. Um, <laughs> the first one I did was 951. Why, you know, why is it two newtons difference? Just for reference. Um, oh, okay. So the, the question is clarified uh, now and it's basically asking about a loaded squat jump. Um, loaded squat jumps are hard. That's, that's for sure. Um, so the question is, you know, if you see like a two newton difference in two tests, what does that mean? Is that, is that you know, an issue? Is that a question? Um, for this particular jump, you can see my, my system weight is 948 and for the counter movement jump, it's 949. Um, realistically, it's probably less than a Newton difference. Um, so as long as your quiet phase is solid, you shouldn't be seeing a whole lot of difference from, from uh, counter movement jump to squat jump. Also important to note that um, I know how to do these tests, right? Because we do them a lot. So, um, so therefore, like, you know, the, the issue of a counter counter movement or, or sorry, a counter movement during the, um, during the squat jump is not going to be an issue for me for the most part, unless I'm really fatigued. It can also be a really good indicator if you have, if you do test squat jump regularly and you find that a certain athlete cannot perform that movement without unweighting when they normally can, hey, there's a, there's a data point as well. Um, they failed, right? So that means that, you know, maybe they are feeling more fatigued. I have another question here. Um, Somebody, Jake asks, what are the reasons, if any, that the unweighting phase in centimeters would be higher than, would be higher than the propulsive phase? So do you mean that the, the depth is greater than the, the jump height? Is that what you mean, Jake, just to clarify? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, that's, that's part of the characteristics of how somebody performs the movement. So for me, I find that I benefit from a, a deeper drop 
during the, the unweighting phase, during the counter movement. Um, some, some athletes are able to achieve a, a greater drop, but with very little drop. And to be honest, it also really depends on how warmed up you are. Um, in my case, I'm not warmed up at all. So not a lot of, uh, you know, not very elastic, not really literally warm. Um, so I found like 36 centimeters for me, if you actually look at my what mean over the last 60 days, um, it's 35. So I'm like right within the mean. So that's kind of what I would look for. What I would say is that there's no good depth value for athletes. Um, they're going to, they're going to get their data. You know, they're, they're going to have their depth, their comfort level that they normally or, or regularly drop to the one. There's actually some really good research on this. You're not supposed to really cue them to drop to a certain depth or not. Um, athletes will self select after a certain number of trials, the optimal depth for their body. And I think that's important. Um, especially if we're using force plates as a monitoring tool. Yeah. Jake, happy to, happy to do it. It's a really good question. Uh, Jason. Might, might, yeah. It might be useful to also then consider if their counter movement depth does change, how does that influence the time it takes to perform that counter movement? Yep. That's, that's a really great point. I'm, I'll do another jump right now and I won't drop very deep and we can actually see really, really easily how that affects subsequent, how that affects other metrics in the system. So I'm just selecting the counter movement jump. My colleague is holding the device there. And, and this time. Yep. So what was the depth? Yeah, so in this particular jump, oh, that was a really bad one. Um, let's go ahead and do another one. I'm not actually saving that one. I'll just do it myself. So just as an example i'll delete these after the fact but so that one i dropped 23 um jumped 39 so i didn't jump as high i dropped less and i'll do one more that's just like a, a really really shallow one what i can do is i can basically force a ridiculous rate of force development a really high rate of force development by not dropping as deep making the actual movement. So in this case, I dropped 13 centimeters. So it's a much more shallow drop. And yet, you know, my RFD is almost 20,000 newtons per second. So, you know, you would think, oh, hey, that's, you know, it's better, right? But it, in fact, it's a, it's a much weaker jump. It's not how my body's put together, right? So again, knowing your athletes is really important, recognizing that, you know, for me, this one's way off the norm, 22 centimeters different than my mean. And the end look result at, is bad. Look at the, look yeah. at the way it uh, changes the shape of the curve as well. Yeah, big time. I mean, the, the, the biggest cue that you can kind of use to modify. How does, how does this, uh, well, I've got a couple more questions coming in here, so. It's a great question there from Eric, and then we've got uh, some clarification from Saeed as well. Yep, so Eric asks about um, scores, not raw scores, but scores used in displaying percentile ranks. Um, yep, yeah, for sure. So in this particular, in this particular case, um, what you can see right here is, sorry, I'm not sure what you guys can see versus what I can see, but uh, for each one of these metrics, I've, I've got a population that I'm comparing to, right? So in this case, um, the scoring for, for all of the results that come out in real time is myself. That's kind of the baseline scoring population. And then I have a time, time select. So I can select a specific point in time that I want to use um, to score everything against. And in this particular case, we use a z-score, but we have it a couple different ways. You can use sort of a standardized, you know, negative four to four, or you can have it weighted against a hundred. Um, I like the weighted scale, just a little bit easier to read, but that's totally up to you um, as a user. <coughs> in addition, in this, I'm not sick. Um, just have to say that. Um, in this particular case, right, like the self score is useful, I think, because it allows you to really monitor change for an individual over time. Oh gosh, there's a whole bunch of chats coming in. Um, but I can also select, for example, an entire team, right? So I could say, okay, well, how do I compare against the entire team? Um, I'm not sure what conversation is going on right there. And one thing that you'll see here is that when, it, when the data populates, I also get a sample size. So for the last 30 days, there's been 190 90 jumps performed in this population, i.e. Hawk and Dynamics demo team. And now these numbers look very different. Obviously the body weight is going to be wildly different, but from a, from a jump height perspective, it's actually exactly the same, which is bizarre. Um, so if I select one of my, one of my different counter movement jumps, we'll see that that, that number will shift. Scoring is, is going to be 
um, can be really useful. But I think the, the real key is that you collect data consistently. So things like your protocol, things like your warm up, all of that really become that much more useful or important um, when you are starting to score things against larger populations. Um, let me just check this Q and A right here. Um, the mobile app is in fact Google Play only um, for our system. Um, that may change uh, in the future, um, hopefully. But one of the issues that we have with um, iOS is that they do not allow you to, actually let me go to my own page here. They don't allow you to uh, utilize Wi-Fi Direct. So our force plates use Wi-Fi Direct. This is just my daughter, but if I select myself on a trend graph, what I can see is, you know, I could look at over time, how am I doing? And I can see that my jump height, that's not what I was hoping to see, is actually trending downward. Um, that's largely because of today. So we had that one, that one week jump, which I'll be deleting to ensure that that doesn't count against <laughs> me anymore. Um, but I'm also seeing my body weight go down, right? So to give you the tools or a few tools to visualize this information, you know, at the point of testing, right? So if I did another jump right now, that was somehow like just monster, it would, uh, it would update in real time. And I can download this as a PDF. I can put notes in it and things like that. Um, I can also look at myself uh, just, just generally if I wanted to look at averages. And this is a page where we're working on some, um, some modifications to it to make it a little bit easier. But I can look at a couple different things here. I can score against a population that I want. Um, I can look at a time period, you know, because there's two, two things to consider. A, who's in the population, what data is in those populations, but also when, you know, when were those tests, when was that data collected that's in that particular population. So what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at, let's just say, I don't know, February to today versus all of last year. And I find that um, for a couple of these metrics for jump height, I'm consistently above what I'm finding modified RSI is slightly above the mean. Um, and breaking RFD is slightly down. Um, you know, is that all bad? No, not necessarily. So it looks like we have more chats going on. Jason's just talking about, um, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, um, great point. The, uh, you know, one of the things that we do offer, you know, is a, is a, is a tablet, standardized tablet that we, we really like from Samsung that works extremely well. So the, the device that works with our app, like that shouldn't be a, a limitation to using our plates for sure. Um, also what I can look at from this page as well is I can just say like, hey, what are the averages looking like? This is a really nice illustration to show um, how different metrics are related to one another. For example, jump height and takeoff velocity, it's almost like it's one-to-one -one, and that's very interesting <laughs> um, because it is. And I can also look at things like, hey, jump height versus modified RSI. It looks like there's something of a relationship there, but sometimes it can be a little bit, um, a little bit confounded, a little bit confusing. And, and I can also use this page like to export an entire athlete's data set. You can do a lot of stuff from here. Um, I'm trying to think, are there any other, are there any other general questions that I can answer um, that Jason can try to answer? I know we've kind of covered a lot of stuff, I think. Um, there's like a whole conversation going on in the chat. I don't know if everybody's reading that, but it's... I'm just trying to test you. <laughs> you can keep up, old man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> next, you know, next, next, we'd like to, we'd like to have another webinar next week. Um, if we can, if we can pull it off, we can put together a topic and a, a really quick presentation. Um, but we'd really love to hear from you guys about, um, I mean, guys, generally, I don't mean men, I mean people. Um, we'd love to hear feedback. We'd love to hear questions that you have, things that you'd like us to cover. Um, we don't wanna to get too in depth, I think on any, on any one of these, just because of time limitations. And we've already gone an hour and 20 minutes and we're, we're gonna cut it off in just a minute, but um, that goes for we blog just wanna give- too. Yeah, yeah, say it again, Jason? I think that goes for blog posts too. If you've got anything you'd like us to try and summarize in a, in a blog post, please, please do ask. That's a really good point. Yeah, J Jason and I have been working on some blog posts. I'm putting myself as co-author, even though I'm not. Um, Jason's been doing some really good <laughs> blog posts for us. Um, we'd love to get more more things that people would like to hear more about. Um, we're also obviously hosting a course uh, in early April, just a couple of weeks now. Um, it's going to be all online format. We have some really great presenters and speakers. Please, if you're interested in that, we'd love to have more people join us. Um, really, really grateful for everybody joining and jumping on today. It's really awesome. And we'd really, you know, we really can't do this without you guys. We also have a, 
I think a three day webinar coming up um, in a couple weeks, maybe even next week. So yeah, that's actually going to be next week, I, I believe. We're working on some of the details on that. Um, uh, we will definitely be sending more information about that, but that that's going to be a situation where we're going to try to raise some money as well for a good cause, given um, what's going on. And you know, uh, we haven't sent out like our our official um, coronavirus update as a company. I think everybody's gotten enough of those emails, but you know, understanding that this is a, a really troubling time for everybody, and and obviously, um, you know, we're 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 here, we're working, but. Um, we're really lucky and, and just understanding there's a lot of people who are not as fortunate as us who really could use a hand, could use some help. And, um, you know, we're looking at this as an opportunity to provide, you know, as much content as we can, um, you know, in, in all the, everybody's got a ton of downtime, right? So let's get, um, let's get some more content. Let's get some more information out there. Let's share information. Let's be, uh, let's get to know one another better. And if anybody has any questions for us, um, would, okay like encourage you to reach out to me directly. Um, my email is my name, Ben at hawkandynamics.com. Jason, we have a, we have a really great team. Like I can't say enough about our team. Um, and I really encourage anybody who has questions or who just wants to chat. Um, we, we talk about this stuff literally all day. Like last night, I think I was on the phone for two hours. My wife's just like, what is wrong with you? Um, but we're excited about it. Right. So we're really, we're fired up and we want to get more people fired up. Um, ooh. Okay. Okay. So somebody asked another question before we, before we wrap up officially, I'm going to answer this one because it's a good one. Um, with a loaded, with a loaded squat jump or a loaded counter movement jump, that's totally fine. No, no sweat. Um, asking about the optimal weight for squat, like, to, to, okay. So P Peter, I believe published a, uh, a PhD on this talking about yeah, yeah. power output with, <laughs> what well, percent of body weight thing. so um <laughs> i don't know if peter's on today but uh <laughs> that's that i can send you some information on that so there there is there is really good really good work on on how to maximize power output um and also you know keep in mind any of the calculations that we perform on the plates we're taking into account the system weight right so even if it's a system weight of body weight plus you know 135 pounds um, everything's still calculated correctly. It's just, they're not going to jump as high, right? Because their mass is that much bigger. And obviously it's a heck of a lot harder to jump with a loaded bar on your back than it is without anything on your back. Um, the power output's going to change. And yeah, there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of differences there. So um, I will send you some information. Please email me directly on that particular one. And I can send you, um, Jason's doing a great job answering everybody individually. Not so I'm bad. not, I keep missing people. Sorry. That's why I've had to just send one to everyone. <laughs> yeah. Like we, we, we love this. This is really a lot of fun. Cause this, this like helps keep us really tuned in with what people are, um, are wondering about what we're not doing a good job with what we can improve upon, um, as a company and obviously, um, listening to, to the market and really understanding how coaches, um, take data in and information in and how we can do a better job at providing it. Um, but yeah, thanks to everybody for joining us today. Obviously, there's no cost. We're not going to spam you with email either, um, but we will update you on other webinars. You can totally unsubscribe. It's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks to everybody that joined us today. Jason, you want to say a word? Yeah, thank you for letting me talk about squiggly lines. I love it. I love that lots of the people love it too. It's almost validating myself. <laughs> Make me feel good. Nice. Thank you. Ex excellent. <laughs> Everybody stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, again, just let us know if there's anything we can do um, to, to, yeah, to, to help sort of further discussion and, and please send, send any questions that you have that we couldn't get to. Thanks a lot. Take care.